the first one is uh, has to do with the image that we see in this uh, in the screen. I was doing research in a library in Bogota, <coughs> and I found this uh, magazine that had a very strange title that I didn't know. Uh, it was called the Journal for the uh, Journal of the Colombian Society for the Study of Modern Times, and it, the, the, the library only had two of these uh, magazines, although the way that they, they show it there, the, the, the down there, it seems like they, they lasted for a long time. But I was very interested in this letter, <coughs> uh, which I'm going to read in English. Dear colleagues, uh, this is uh, dated in Popayan, which is a city in the southwest of Colombia, very small city. but had a very important uh, past in the, in the Spanish colony. <clears throat> Dear colleagues, for the past years, for, for the past week, I've been in this city doing field work for the society. Work towards the material culture inventory is going along with some minor bumps. But I will write in detail about that on another letter that I will enclose with this one. I had a very interesting encounter with comrades Valencia and Patino but I will touch on that on the aforementioned letter. Something, however, caught my attention at Valencia's house. A little Soviet pamphlet that, according to Valencia, is titled Clarifications on the Errors Inherent to the Early Painting of the Revolution. Valencia translated it, translated that title, and I suspect that, the, but that his knowledge of Russian is not as good as he claims it is. <clears throat> Reluctantly, Valencia read, while translating it, parts of the pamphlet. The author states that some painters mixed up materialism with idealism and ended up making paintings that exist between a pure idea and a simple thing, perplexing whomever looks at them, thus distracting from more, more urgent matters. I'm sure Valencia spoke those last words with contempt. The pamphlet had some illustrations. Valencia's ironic tone aroused my curiosity. I wanted to like those Soviet painters. I must confess, however, that I was speechless when I saw the reproduction of a painting by one Casimir Malevich. I didn't see a thing. I asked for a magnifying glass and just found the most tenuous insinuation of a crooked square among the screen dots. There was nothing there, but why then? Does the pamphlet's author argue that these paintings are at the risk of being a mere thing? If we can see a thing, aren't we, aren't we at least seeing painting? Isn't that something? I tried to discuss this with Valencia, but he was disdainful. That is the problem with you people, he said. You have spent years on that inventory, and while you, all your critical capacity is and meanwhile, all your critical capacity is lost on the minutia of things. So I was very uh, surprised to see this reproduction of white on white by Malevich in this, uh, <coughs> in this magazine, because in a way, the technology of reproduction of the painting got in the way of seeing the painting. You're not seeing actually the painting, but you're seeing the dots that make up the painting. So when this person was looking at the, at the reproduction through the magnifying glass, he was seeing the screen that creates the illusion of the painting, but he was, uh, wasn't actually seeing the painting. Which, which takes me to story number two. I should have started by saying that I'm very short-sighted. Each morning when I wake up, I must look for my glasses. <clears throat> this has become an automatic response. Most of the time, I just have to reach with my arm into the nightstand, and there are my glasses. But sometimes something happens at night, and I can't find my glasses. The scene becomes really comical. I have to really go close into the world to try to see where those glasses are. And then all the world becomes a giant surface that, is, that I explore at 10 centimeters of distance. 
This is an image of an erotic practice that has been emerging lately in Japan, eyeball licking. Look at it and think about it. Think about what is happening. For example, think about the eye. It is rendered blind for a while, and at the same time, it is uh, and at the same time that it is blind, it is feeling something. But the eye is feeling something that it is not seeing. Uh, and it's probably pleasurable. Feeling but not seeing, the tongue on the other side is rendered mute. Speech and sight brushing and rubbing against each other and being mute. Then there's this image that I saw on a paper by an art historian called James Elkins. Uh, this is a, an engraving from the Middle Ages and this is an imaginary animal, although we don't, we're not sure if, the, if it was just imagination at that time, or the status of imagination as a source of imagery w had the same status that it has today. But this little animal is very interesting because as it eats the plants that grow around it, and it, the, the stem that supports it grow, it will die because it will be taller and he won't be able to reach to the plants and eat them and he will die. <clears throat> and it will become some sort of uh, carnivorous dandelion or something like that. But what is also interesting is the way that uh, people at, at, the, at that time imagined uh, animals as made of parts that they already seen. And so this was the assumption that the world had a was materially continuous, that it was the same in the micro and the macro. There was no difference between uh, the world that we can see and the world that we didn't see. So when the, when the microscope was discovered, and these are one of, one of the first illustrations of, of microbes from the 18th century, there appear a whole new kind of animals that didn't exist before, that weren't made of parts of other animals, but th that they had different parts. So there was no uh, continuity of the material world. There, there, there is a huge difference between what is infinitely small and what is infinitely big. There are different laws governing this. A few years ago, I was in a farm in the mountains in Colombia, and as in most farms, there are always uh, magazines that you don't uh, know how they got there. And there was this magazine called Theology Today, and there was a very interesting essay there, of a theologian that was uh, appalled by the ubiquity of images in the, in the modern world. He was very, uh, let me... He, he was appalled by, by these images because he felt that they are very gross and that they were very... Uh, that they destroyed the possibility of the miracle of the image and that uh, theological thought wasn't thinking about the, the, the possibility of images being uh, miraculous. So he proposed that uh, images would be... Uh, not to destroy images as they did, the, as the iconoclasts did, but to make images more precarious, more, more crude, so that they will... That, so that you could uh, uh, be witness to this miracle of the, of the image. There is this orchid uh, that creates this illusion of a bumblebee, and it attra attracts the, ma the male bumblebees to, to it so that uh, the, the, the male has the illusion that it is mating with an actual bee, and it is going to pollinate, so the, the, the orchid uses the bee to pollinate itself. The thing is that these orchids today are a... Um, reproducing without uh, the bees, because these bees, this species of bees, is extinct. So this is the only image we have 
of this be. But the, <laughs> the interesting thing is that we're seeing an image that is produced by nature, and it is not an image that, uh, it's not a photographic image, it's not a man-made image, but an image of a camouflage that is made by nature, that is the only trace we have of an actual uh, animal that existed that we can't see anymore. A friend of mine uh, had his. Uh, a friend of my, uh, the, the sister of a friend of mine was killed, and he was very sad. And he showed me his arm, and he showed me that he had uh, the scars that were left by all the fighting that they did when they were little. And he showed me the scars, and he said that those were the only uh, things that were left by her. And I saw my arm, and I didn't see any scars. The Russian poet Osip Mandelstam uh, was persecuted by the KGB. And he became very paranoid. The thing is that he always said that his poems were came to him like words in the air that he heard a kind of noise, and th that noise gradually became a word, and the word a poem. And that, in that way, he felt that he was receiving a transmission, and from, and from that transmission, he wrote the poem. As he became more paranoid, because he was being persecuted by the KGB, he began to hear more voices, so he began to produce more poems. So the KGB was uh, more after him, because he was producing more poems. But it was very dangerous for him to have these poems written. So uh, what he did was have her wi his wife memorize all his poems. And she kept a living archive of all his poems in her, he in her head. And when, <clears throat> when, and when she flee flee to the to the West, she uh, transcribed all the poems, and then she forget them forgot them. Yes. I wonder whether you still, after Mandelstam's poetry for a part has been published in the West, do you still know all of his poetry by heart? No. And the prayers had come into the memory, and they begin to forget the poetry, and they don't know what to do with it. If I all of his poetry, one or a few that you love best, and would say it. I can say the Sihene is Vestam Saudati, Iose. Kakose. Not the bees. The bees, pcholi. Ita ose. Вооруженный зрением узкий хвост, сосущий хвост земной, хвост земной. Я помню все, с чем светиться пришлось, и вспоминаю наизусть и в суе. At the same time, uh, the Soviets were also very interested in this idea of, of, of pa paranormal transmission of information through electricity. And there is this Konstantin uh, Haudive, who was a scientist that investigated the transmission of, of voices from dead people through the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. So here, are a, here is a, a recording of of some of the of some of the voices that he that he uh, found now the experimenter calls the russian poet vladimir mayakovsky and is there a way to to raise a little bit the, the sound voice answers this is the voice of mayakovsky Already there. Mayakovsky. The experimenter tells the poet how difficult it is to convince people of the reality of the voice phenomenon 
and in reply comes a statement which is typical for Mayakovsky's personality. Konstantin Pluy. In Russian, Konstantin, spit on it. The experimenter talks to his former teacher, the Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset, and the voice calls out, Ortega. The experimenter asks, whether the research into the voice phenomenon had any significance and whether it was based on firm foundations. The voice answers, Entrojas muchas cuestiones. Spanish. You will solve many questions. A Latvian voice then breaks in with a statement that could be interpreted in various ways. It might mean, for instance, that the voice phenomenon research may benefit mankind even if the process is a painful one. Tu laudes zadetzina. Latvian, you are burning people. So th this uh, thing of, of hearing voices in noise seems like a kind of uh, pseudoscience, something that is not uh, real. But it's interesting that now uh, one of the directions where image research is heading is in the capacity of machines to learn to actually see or to, to know what they are seeing. And of course, that is going to be very useful and it's very useful for security purposes, for example, recognizing faces. So the kind of, of software that is being used to, uh, th that is this being designed to, to see is a, it's, it's modeled on, on, it's one of those neural uh, networks, which is a kind of software that is not uh, linear, but it's uh, a swarm of different uh, pieces of, of software that, that come together to analyze something and try to reproduce the connections between neurons in the, in the human brain. And that way they analyze things. Uh, researchers at Google have um, have used this software to, of course, recognize faces and try to make images searchable because the image was like a great void in the in the apparatus of, of, of Google, and what they want is to make images actually searchable. But then, what is interesting is that when you apply that software uh, to a random image. Because you have to teach the, the, the software to recognize something. So for example, in the first image, we see uh, the, the software is taught to recognize towers and pagodas. And you apply that to any image, and it will find towers and pagodas in any image. The, the second image is uh, trees. And it finds, uh, I'm sorry, it's of an image of trees, and it, uh, the software is looking for buildings. And it transforms all those uh, trees into buildings. And the same with leaves and birds and insects. Uh, what it is very interesting is that it, the, these so this software that is used to, to make us more secure, to recognize faces, to see where people are going, uh, is also um, hallucinating in a way, is using the structure of a hallucination to, to create, to, to see things that are not there. But, but in a way, seeing things that are not there was like the realm of, of, 
of art and also the realm of paranoia and schizophrenia. So it's, it, it's very interesting that, that uh, this whole idea of, of a images as something that are stable is completely off the books now and we are back to this idea of, of, of of the image as something that, that is always a, in the process of becoming something else. Uh, in this case, of course, it's image as information. But this takes us very far away from this idea of the photographic image as index, as we had learned in art school and all that, all that theory of photography that was very important in the late uh, 20th century. In a way, this this uh, this image has to do a lot with painting more than it had to do with photography, but not painting in the formalistic way, but painting in the in the sense of 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 seeing things that are not uh, really there. Which brings me back to to another essay by by James Selkins. A, that is called on the impossibility of a close reading. And in this essay, he discusses the fact that you cannot, uh, he, he tries to dispel the myth that the, be that the closer you look at something, the better you see it. Because he uses this uh, Paleolithic uh, baton that is, is, has some markings on, uh, it's a bone with markings. Um, that they have a, that have a clear intentionality. You see that there is a rhythm, that there is a pattern, that, that someone intentionally made these markings with uh, with some kind of, of significant uh, impulse. That there was some kind of, of significant impulse going there on. But as he gets closer to each marking, trying to decipher what these markings meant, if it was a calendar, if it was decoration, he couldn't. Uh, be sure which was the main marking and which were the accidents of the markings. See, you see that there are little lines that go all over, and since this uh, bone was uh, buried for a long time and had a, a, a history in the ground and perhaps full of accidents, it wasn't. It, it it would be impossible to determine what really happened there. So. There is a point where you get so close to the image that the image disappears, that there is no way that you can actually decipher uh, significance on the image just on account of you seeing it from up close. So, in a way, if you, if you go back to the, the, the software algorithm, we are actually trying to see things onto the image. We're, we're translating, we're, we're giving back to the image things. There is a scene from, uh, from the novel by Balzac called The Unknown Masterpiece, in which uh, two painters are confronted with a, with a very well-resolved painting. And one of the, the painters, which is more experienced, asks the question, what is missing from this painting? And he answers his own question, saying, ah, it's nothing, but that nothing is everything he adds. And he, and he takes the brush from a more younger painter and starts finishing that painting. And he, and he makes little touches of white, little very subtle brush strokes that really transform the painting and that give the illusion of transparency, of air, of things that are not really there. Uh, the kind of illusion that you see, for example, in this painting by Velázquez, where you see uh, where you see the dress of the Infanta, and you actually feel that it's a dress made of satin. But if you go up close and you see uh, what it is made of, it's just little dots of white. Uh, and so, so it's really, really interesting to see how uh, the image is always in. Um, in a constant fight with the support, with the, the, the vehicle that holds it together. And it's always at the point of, of, of almost being destroyed by one little error 
and the whole thing will, will just collapse. This same thing is also true in digital imagery because if you go clo in close, you don't have any, you don't have any um, indexical relationship with reality, but you have just uh, pixels that are, are swarming to create the illusion of, of, of something. And if you alter the m a minimal of information, the whole thing changes. Uh, so this nothing that is uh, missing from the painting is, is uh, to, to Frenhofer, this painter is an everything. And it, it's very funny because when, when he pu puts on these little white, uh, little touches of white, it, it makes the painting disappear. It, makes us, it, it, it gives the illusion of painting as something that is completely transparent, that it has no body. And it's funny because it's, uh, it's, those are brush strokes that you can actually see. So you are always seeing the, the, the matter that creates the illusion of transparency and you're also seeing something that is transparent. You're seeing a satin dress, but also you're seeing brush strokes of white. Uh, that uh, possibility of seeing the image in its illus illusionary state and also the precariousness of the support of the image, I think is a very important thing that, has to, that we have to remind ourselves with because Nowadays, we live in a, in a time where images are always, almost always completely transparent. They are not opa opaque. And if you can't see the opacity of the image, then uh, you'll be in trouble because you'll be completely sucked up by the illusion of the world of image. And this world of image, in a way, is also a metaphor of the whole fabrication of, of, of truth and fact in the world, which takes me probably to, to, to this uh, very interesting video that I found the other day in, in the internet. Well, good morning, everyone. During Barack Obama's speech at 2012 APAC Policy Conference at the Washington Convention Center, the camera spotted a very odd individual, who may be either with the U.S. Secret Service, or with the Israels, and could be a strong evidence of a shapeshifter alien humanoid working for the powers that be, caught in a high-definition video during an event of the Zionist cabal. Four years ago, I stood before you and said that Israel's security is sacrosanct. It is non-negotiable. That belief has guided my actions as president. Even though at first sight he looks just like the average Secret Service spook, a series of odd features on his head, face, plus a very strange behavior and creepy movements, suggest something else. But due to the low lighting in half the amphitheater, he would pass unnoticed or regarded as a normal human being by the crowd and everybody who watched this video, if it was not by the camera of the Jewish News 1, which caught him from another angle apparently shape-shifting into some sort of reptilian non-human form. Disregard all the distortions and image artifacts caused by post-edition zooming, and pay close attention to how his head features suddenly change. His ears, his nose, his chin, cheekbone, jaw and mouth, are no longer looking human at all. Matter of fact now he has a blatant non-human face, so what just happened? Did his shape-shifting device fail during Obama's speech? 
in the middle of an amphitheater crowded with people. Is he an actual reptilian humanoid? Is he one of the Anunnaki? Is he a tall grey bio-android, or what? Is that video evidence, that the Illuminati elite is in bed with at least one ancient extraterrestrial race, hidden in plain sight, and pulling the strings of mankind? So, again, this uh, thread of, of... Sorry. So again, this thread of, 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 of paranoia uh, that also leaks into the perception of images is really interesting. And what is troubling, I mean, the, this whole video is, of course, absolutely troubling because it's uh, absolutely racist, uh, anti-Semitic. It has all the most horrible things that you can imagine, but it also it also evidences the lack of uh, the, the, the possibility that people are beginning to lack the perception that there is a medium, that, th 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 that there is a medium through which the image exists. And, and then these images are confounded with fact, and they are not seen as images. And... Uh, so th th this, this person just makes an a infinite zoom into the video, and of course, uh, lots of information is lost when you go near, as we, as we saw. And, and the, the face of the uh, Secret Service agent is transformed into a reptilian. Uh, but he is not aware of the fact that there is no, inf no possibility of infinite zoom. That only happens uh, in CSI when they say, let's enhance the video. And you can read uh, uh, a license plate from kilometers. The thing is that uh, technology will, will actually get to that point. And uh, if the machines are learning to see, and we, we, we've seen, we see how they are learning to see, uh, this possibility of enhancement is not uh, f a fantasy, but it's in the hands of a m neural network that has a paranoid structure. So that's what I think. That, that's why I think that, that uh, in a way, going back to uh, the critique of the image that painting uh, has, that is inherent to painting, is really a very good point to 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 think about uh, or to to counteract this uh, the ubiquitousness of 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 the digital image, um, and that's. Uh, <laughs>